Hi, friend. Hi, friend. And to the brave hearts listening out there, welcome to Permission to be Human. I'm Andrea. And I'm Janelle. Get ready for some real-time relationship woo and wisdom from the front lines with occasional tantrums and tears about how breaking rules, blurring boundaries, and tossing tradition can be catalysts for finding your truth. Let's debunk the fairy tales we were told as children and create a new map for life. Yes, Disney can go fuck itself. (laughs) If you're seeking permission to choose your own path, freedom is the new F word, people, and want to feel less alone along the way, we we got got you. you. Please note, this is our side of the story. Our partners and metamors have their own individual experiences, and we do not speak for them. Hi, Janelle. (laughs) Hi, Andrea. How you doing today? Great. We're a little warm here in Colorado. A little bit warm, maybe hundreds a day. Yep, yep. But let's not talk about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> this is actually one of the things I would say. Um, it's, it's a little story from my corporate days when I would get in the elevator and go up to my like twenty second floor, and I would just think as I got in the elevator, Andrea, do not talk about the weather. Don't even fucking think about it. Like you find somebody in the elevator and you compliment them on their dress or something else. Like, don't be that person. Right. Wow. So you had that mentality early on. Law, it's a longstanding flag. You've stood in the ground. I'm not talking about the weather. I'd say since my 30s, maybe my late 20s. I'm like, no, just like, let's just not do that small talk. It's okay. I get it. But let's do something more interesting. Okay. So let's talk about something more interesting. Yes. Today. Such as <laughs> your time going abroad. To Costa Rica, or yes. should we talk about your spirit crown? One of the two. Let's just do spirit crowns today. Yours is also really different. Like, yes. You've got some butterflies, some art paper. I see no flowers. I see no feathers. Um, that's because this, I made this one. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, so cool. <laughs> I made this during COVID um, on a Zoom call bachelorette party oh my for God. Um, one of the women in my women's circle. So she was getting married. So we all had like our own arts and crafts and we made spirit crowns. Yeah. This is this is a COVID story. Happy wedding. (laughs) COVID crown. Nice. COVID crown. We'll call it your COVID crown. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how do what is mine? Mine. I really love it. And it's it's a little (laughs) bridesmaidsy. You look if you were at a wedding, you would be rocking it. Okay. Okay. Great. I never go to weddings anymore. Yeah. Weddings are fun. There was a wedding actually just at Everland this year. I'll say happy wedding, Booster and Kate. And everyone uh-huh. had a spirit crown <gasps> on. So you yeah. would like mean. That is so awesome. Yeah. Love that idea of a wedding. Okay. So we we're going to talk about Costa Rica, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So I think we have to start out this episode by talking about Pura Vida. Pura Vida. Okay. So what does Pura Vida mean? Pura Vida, I'm saying it, I'm trying to say it with an accent, probably failing. It means the good life or the pure life. So in Costa Rica, it can be sometimes used as a greeting, like hello or goodbye. The end of a transaction at the store, they might say, Pura Vida. And it's good vibes overall. So we learned that very quickly. But I also d- decided quickly after we moved there that to get to the Pura Vida, you have to go through the Pita Vida. And the Pita Vida stands for pain in the ass life. I mean, seriously, it might have been the day that my car door handle fell off in my hand, (laughs) literally fell off in my hand. It might have been the day when the frogs started jumping through the window into our house. (laughs) And I'm not talking about tiny frogs. I'm talking about like a doorknob sized frog. (laughs) Let's see. It might have been the day when we first drove through a a pothole that was bigger than the car itself. Um, full of water. And I was like, oh my God, we're going to like sink into the earth. <laughs> Never be seen again. But we didn't. We totally came out of it. So, and, and then like on Sundays, you know, the water would stop working for six hours. But we just got used to that. And those were, you know, somewhat first world complaints. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but so the pita turned into pura. The thing, those things never went away. You true. just got comfortable. I did. I just got mm-hmm. used to them. Mm-hmm. Get used to just about anything if you try. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited because I've been part of the journey with you. I actually even visited you when you were in Costa Rica, which, did. Is, which is incredible. And I remember hearing the story, but I can't wait for you to share. Is why did you move to Costa Rica? We always knew we wanted to live abroad 
when my daughter was young. I wanted to show her a different culture. And during COVID, we started doing Zoom meetings. Who's the, who's I had already started doing Zoom meetings, but my husband started using Zoom for his psychotherapy practice. And I thought, okay, this is the time. We can go abroad and he's not going to lose his, his clients. Mm. He can continue his business. I knew what I could continue my business pretty much any time because I was already on Zoom. But it was a perfect timing for him. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get out of our comfort zone. We loved our life in Denver, but we knew that leaving our comfort zone in another country would be a good lesson, mm-hmm. a good walk through fire for the good of our soul. Mm-hmm. For all, and really for all of you. Yes, I would say for all of us. One of the important reasons that I usually mention too is that I wanted to get away from Amazon, mm. especially during Zoom, during Zoom, <laughs> during COVID. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, you know, even now you order something and it is literally there four hours later. And it's very convenient, but it's just too easy to buy, right? And just to buy every time you're almost out of something. And I, it just, it became a bit of a spending frenzy, mm. even with things we needed. And I wanted to get away from that culture. Mm. So we left. Yeah, you left. And tell us, how old was your daughter at that time? And how did she feel about it? She was 12. She was excited for something different. I'm fortunate that she wasn't resistant at all. Mm-hmm. Waldorf schools are, are all around the world, and they all operate on the same curriculum. So... We knew that she was going to get the same classes and ideas and lessons, even if she was at a Waldorf school in Costa Rica. Oh, so there's actually a Waldorf school in Costa Rica. Yes, in Costa Rica. And there was a couple different ones. And we largely based the decision about where we would live on the fact that there was a Waldorf school there. And it was on the beach and had been been built two years ago and was really beautiful. She had a truly amazing year and didn't want to leave. So... Mission accomplished there. Mm -hmm. Like lots of adaptable lessons, lots of Spanish. And she was surrounded by expat kids. One of the most beautiful ways she described her classroom life in Costa Rica was that in the United States, when a new kid comes into the class, that kid is typically, at least in her experience, out until they're in. They have to earn their place in the class. Mm. She felt like when she went to Costa Rica – that she was in already on the first day. Right. And I remember her class size was quite small. And so the fact that she got like, so you're in right away feels like super important because there's not that many kids. Yeah, there was only 13 kids in her class. And they had all been, most of them had been together since first grade. Oh, wow. So she was coming in to a class that had already formed its friendships and its bonds. And... She had a really good time. It was, it was a wonderful experience for her. Okay, so you were there for 11 months. Yes. What would be three of your top takeaways? I think the first is that alone time is critical for everyone, even extroverts like me. It was the biggest ingredient for my transformation in Costa Rica. It took five circumstances getting away from my friends, having less relationships to tend to, having some distance from family, slowing down my business, living in a less commercial place, for sure. I mean, when the grocery store is dimly lit and disorganized, you do not want to linger and spend more money. (laughs) (laughs) But Whole Foods knows what they're doing, right? They're like, we're going to make it so beautiful that you don't want to leave. Mm. In Costa Rica, that's just not the case. So I didn't want to go grocery shopping. And when I did, I hurried in and out. And there was no Amazon. Right. And so that gave me a lot more alone time, a lot less time, more time for myself. I meditated. I sat. I journaled. I wandered. I took plant medicine. I sat in a sweat lodge. I went to a retreat. I walked in the water. I ran by the ocean. But it takes time, and sometimes it takes time to really start listening to the voices in your head. Mm. Is there another lesson that you gleaned from being alone? Yes. (laughs) 
Costa Rica was transformational in this way. With all the time I had to sit and meditate and think, I realized that I was in a codependent relationship and was terrified of not having a partner and terrified of living alone. Mm. And it was super scary. I contemplated that. I had to face the idea of it. And it was just so scared. I, I, I remember you helping me through this. It was such a difficult time. And I was, oh my gosh, I don't even know how I got through this now. Not every, in fact, when I have hard times now, I'm just like, oh yeah, it's not as bad as that. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And to put it into context for the brave parts, it was several months, I would say, of you living in a state of deep fear. Uh-huh. At the thought of your relationship ending and the looking different or mm -hmm. combined with the idea of then you living alone. But it was – that actually wasn't happening. No. It was the fear of it happening that had you really, I would say, almost paralyzed for a while. I was focusing on the what if yeah. and not the what is, to quote Glennon Doyle. Yes. And that was a big problem. I was sad depressed, really having a hard time. Mm -hmm. It was a pinnacle of my life, I would say. A, yeah. A real turning point for me when I finally came home to myself and said, oh, no one is going to save me from this tower of sadness but myself. Mm -hmm. And I had to claim myself. And that became my phrase for the year. Mm-hmm. And I really have said it too many times, but like I, I was, it was such an honor to witness you. And like I have, like I can, I feel the emotion coming up now, like watching you go through that. Me knowing fully well that you would be just fine if you lived alone. And yet I'm acknowledging the fear to even contemplate that, what that, how that gripped you mm -hmm. and watch you be brave. And let yourself feel it to the depths of your soul to really face it. It was huge. And I'm so grateful for that experience yeah. as hard as it was. Mm -hmm. And Costa Rica really provided it. Like that was the backdrop that allowed this truth to kind of surface. Because here, Amazon allowed it to be distracted. Like you could distract yourself from it. Mm, I think you're right. Yeah. And here, the rushing helps you helps distract us all from what's actually going on. Yeah. Yeah. The listening for me, I know, happens. It's, it's the slowness. It's not the loud. I, I actually sometimes think our bodies actually can be very loud talking <laughs> to us. But we are like just have so much input coming in to distract ourselves from the noise of in the loudness of how our, mm. our bodies. I don't actually, th I think being quiet can help, but I think being slow, moving slow. Is better. Or is as potent part of it. I used to say, Elizabeth Gilbert says, if you listen to the whispers, you don't have to hear the screams. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, my intuition, just, I didn't have a good relationship with it for a long time. So, and I always say it like threatens, threatened to pack up and leave because I wasn't listening. Right. Mm -hmm. I was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I know. I know that's what you're saying, but no, I need more proof. I'm going to go ahead and just like do this linear research instead. Mm -hmm. And I had enough time and slowness to listen, enough reduction of distraction to listen to those voices. Yeah, to listen to the voices. And, and is it the, is it, it's funny because I often think of voices as like, what I don't want to listen to, like I don't want to listen to the voices in my head. Mm. I want to quiet those. And what I'm listening to is more that whisper or it's it, – it's, Knowing? It, it's a knowing. That's a good question. I'm not sure. I can – I think it – whatever works for you, mm -hmm. right? Right. Like, like and maybe – flavor. Brave hearts, yeah. Maybe you hear a honking horn. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe you hear the flowers blowing in the field. Like, right. And you know that. That's your intuition whispering, talking to you. But whatever it is, you have to slow down enough to hear it, to listen. Mm. I think I also learned that slowing down is okay. 
I'm a pretty fast energy person. I grew up in a fast energy family. It was always moving. Everyone was always moving, and it served us really well. We're an ambitious family, hardworking, goal-oriented. But we had a fuzz buster in every car. Do you know what a fuzz buster is? Is that like it's one of these word. things? Like, like the um, is, that, is that the vacuum, a hand vacuum? Ah, that's or a dust buster. Dust buster. That's a dust buster. It's a fuzz buster Very thing for a sweater where you Very. would <laughs> take the dust bunnies off the sweater. <laughs> that is such a good guess, right? A fuzz buster is a small machine in your car that tells you when a cop is near. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a radar. Detector. Yeah, a radar detector. It's really a radar detector. I don't know. Fuzzbuster is a casual, some kind of slang term. So do you understand what I'm talking about? We'd be driving along and it would just go beep. And we'd be like, okay, we have to stop speeding now. Mm-hmm. So it was permission to speed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this was just a way of life. This is, I mean, other people had fuzzbusters too. This right. is just how it worked. So our life was fast. Lists were non-negotiable. And when I was around 11... My mom got a really bad migraine after a water ski fall. It was scary. I remember her lying down on the bed, and she couldn't feel the right side of her body. Whoa. She ended up in the ER. When she returned home, my parents put up signs around the house, and they all said, slow down. Mm. It's a big message for our family around stress and moving too fast. Mm -hmm. But changing habits is hard. And I, I think there are some flyers out there, flyer people and grounder people. You know, some people need, need the lift off the ground and some people need the strings to pull them back down. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely someone who's a flyer and needs the grounding. Mm -hmm. This became apparent once when we were buying a really nice chair for our living room. And when we, were, we were buying this beautiful, expensive leather chair. And it rocked. And my husband and my daughter were like, oh, my God, yeah, we're totally getting this. This is so great. And I'm just like, no way. I'm like, I cannot have rocking. I need to be able to sit down and, like, like have the bolting to the ground. And I thought that was such an interesting preference. Like, mm. and I'm like oh, yeah, I need that because I'm da -da 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 like running around. They won out, actually, so we got the, the glider. But, um, <laughs> but So uh, what I'm hearing, though, so what was Costa Rica for you? Costa Rica was grounding for your flying energy? I slept because I had you slow down? Yes. So I'm – thanks for bringing me back. I was flying constantly and it really did tell me, oh, slowing down is okay. Mm -hmm. Like it's okay to go slower. I mean Peace Corps did that for me. Having a baby did it for me. And when you walk instead of drive to the store, you do notice different things. Mm -hmm. And when you sit still for longer than 10 seconds, you know, you enter a new realm. And in Costa Rica – I would also set out to run five errands and I'd want to get them all done, you know, in an, in an hour and a half that I had. And I would go out to get those errands done and I would get none of them done mm -hmm. because of an inconvenience or a tree mm -hmm. in the road or mm -hmm. somebody's daughter had a baby and so they closed early or whatever. So it just forced me to just be like, oh, well, guess that's not happening today. And I would just, my whole system would just start to slow down. Right. I would imagine, I can just imagine you here in the States, if someone closed early, that how that would actually elevate you quite a lot. Yeah. Okay. So of your three things, I've heard so far that alone time is critical. Slowing down is okay. And what's the third one? Mm -hmm. You don't need a lot of stuff. I know we've heard it many times. <laughs> um, I used to say whatever the question is, TJ Maxx is not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Jack Kerouac said, if you own a rug, you own too much. But then I also just saw The Big Lebowski and he talks about a rug and how it really brings, brings a rug to a room together. <laughs> a rug really brings a room together. See, look at this rug in your beautiful room. It's bringing the room together. But yeah, I just didn't need a lot of stuff. And I, I think the rug would have given me permanence. Like, oh, maybe we're staying. Maybe we're putting down roots here. But we weren't. Mm-hmm. So when we joined the Peace Corps in our 30s, that was one of the lessons too. We had been traveling after Peace Corps for nine months through the Middle East and North Africa with just our backpack, right? And then we got home and went through all of our stuff in the basement, and it was so overwhelming. You know, why did I have five ladles? Why did I have five candles? Why did I have five hoodies? Mm -hmm. And we really downsized. And in Costa Rica, we lived very simply. Um, 
you know, I had no drawer full of tape and earbuds and extra phone chargers and birthday candles and books. I just had my shiny pink bag from Target and my computer and my journal. And that was it. And I just didn't, I didn't need anything else. And even when I would go to other people's houses, you'd look around and they just didn't have that much stuff because they hadn't just been to Costco, right? Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't have just been to to Costco. Okay, great. Thank you for your three big takeaways. And I know there's so many more stories. And one of my favorite stories is when you came back, you actually gave me a shell ring. I'm wearing mine right now on my pinky ring. Um, And there was a beautiful lesson that these shells taught you. When I first went to Costa Rica, I remember going to the beach and everybody was looking out at the sea. And of course, I I was too for a time. But mostly I was staring at the shells. Like I could not get enough of the shells. Like I would just stare at the ground and walk and look at the shells at low tide. To me, the shells were like art scattered across the sand. They made me so happy. There were ice cream cones and giraffe horns and leopard print like figures in fetal position and neon purple and yarn yellow and all these big orange line paws that like fit so neatly across a mermaid's breast like I was just like this is beautiful this is real I can't believe this seems like a fairy tale so my favorite ones looked like little volcanoes they were white topped and they had like these root beer brown zigzagging across the slopes and eventually I looked them up I hope they had some cool name like lava domes or volcanic violets or something. And no, they're called limpets. Like, what a terrible name. But here's what limpets do. They, they attach themselves to rocks so strongly that even powerful currents can't remove them. In fact, when limpets are fully clamped down, they will allow themselves to be destroyed rather than letting go of the surface. <laughs> do you see a metaphor here? <laughs> possibly destroying themselves by not letting go (laughs) holding on so tightly oh my gosh I mean I I was just like is this really happening to me like is someone filming my life like this is crazy this you cannot make this shit up so this way of being this sticking on to things and not letting go helps them stay alive and it burdens them limpets are not good at conscious endings they're not good at letting go limpets would rather suffer with certainty than risk uncertainty. Ever been a limpet? I have, for sure. So yeah, I had a lot of limpets. Yes, you have. And I also see you like moving past that, that the limpet has been this lesson and you are now gently, gracefully, eyes shut, mouth open, starting to let go. Thank you. Thank you, friend. That's a beautiful lesson. So. I want to remind our brave hearts about a way that you have described yourself. Oh. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I know what you're going to say. You ultimately do the hard and brave thing, but you're anxious and nervous the entire time along the way. And I know anxiety is something you've been working on for a long time. What did Costa Rica teach you about that? I have to hand it to the Ticos and the Ticas. Tico and Tica are the female and male word for what you call Costa Ricans. In Costa Rica, stress seemed invisible or not present in others. The highway, which ran through Nosara, where I lived, was a little bit like the wild, wild west. Seatbelts weren't really enforced. Um, And at any given time, you could probably see 10 things running down this highway. You can see Land Rovers, expats driving their Land Rovers, massive semis, tiny little golf carts with tourists, horses, motorcycles with a family of five, the little boy in the front eating a massive sandwich. (laughs) My favorite visual ever. A truck with 30 to 40 men in the back. Surfers walking three abreast. Bicycles razors, and any other form of go-kart you can think of, right? So at any time, you could see any of these vehicles. And often enough, you'd see a car stopping to talk to a friend on the side of the road. And behind this car would be a 20-car backup. And not once 
Not once did I see someone lift a middle finger. Not once. What about a horn? Not even a horn. Like I would look, I, I became my habit to look for mad faces. I would look around and I'd be like, no, he doesn't seem pissed off. What about him? Nope. Nothing. It was really amazing how relaxed they were. I have to credit it partially to being in a surfing ocean town. I think that slowed things down. In San Jose, I think there was likely a faster pace, the capital of Costa Rica. But I realized even upon leaving, I said to my husband one day, have you ever seen a Costa Rican running or racing to catch something, you know, like a bus? Like they're running, like they're late for something. Right. Like they can't, they're not going to make it, you know, like to get on a, a truck or to get on a surfboard. And he's like, nope, not once. Cannot imagine that. It doesn't happen. They're, and they're not lazy. They just refuse to be anxious. And so... Do you think they refuse to be anxious or do they just realize that something else is more important? Like the timeliness isn't what's important? Good point. But not timeliness. Like what if they miss the bus? They're just like not worried if they miss the bus. They're like, guess I'll get the next one. Maybe I'll go tomorrow. <laughs> Actually, I won't go at all. Like I think the consequence of the non-rushing doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. So they're just a lot more relaxed. And I found myself wanting them to be anxious sometimes. Mm. There was a time when my husband and I were at a high-end seafood restaurant on the beach. We had a great meal. The restaurant was full. We went to our car. We were blocked in by this other truck. Not a huge deal, but like we needed to get home because my daughter was there. And so we went back in and we're like, hey, we need help with the situation. Someone's blocking us in. Could you help us? And, and this guy who was serving, he, he just looked at me and he just smiled, the biggest smile, and just kept his exact same pace as he walked and delivered the food to the people. And then he slowly walked back to me and started addressing the situation, but not with enough urgency, right? I was just like, oh, he doesn't know. He's totally not. He's not going to hurry. Like, he doesn't care about this. And it isn't a big deal when I recount it now. I'm like, yeah, who cares? He's just like, who cares? Eventually, we'll find the guy that has the truck. But at the time, my husband and I were like, uh, okay, could he, like, we just, we need to go. I guess that's an American attitude. Mm. And what do you think? I think it's just the contrast, right? Like, I mean, it, it's, it's, is it an American attitude? Sure. When any, like, if I get blocked in, it's like, what the heck? Because I've got a, a list of things <laughs> I'm doing that day. So that means like something's not going to happen. Right. Um, so I totally relate to that. And... What I love, though, is that in the analysis of it, you're realizing, oh, is, is, is my urgency valid? Yeah. That's what I'm wondering. Is my urgency valid? I'm not sure it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe. Right. And as a lesson maybe to bring back. So one of the lessons from Costa Rica is that it's not that you're going to like eliminate all anxiety out of, your, out of your life, but that sometimes it might be a choice. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I also would really want to clarify something for the Bravehearts because they might think, given that you live in Colorado and that when you chose everywhere in the world to go for your year abroad, that you went to Costa Rica, that you actually might be an outdoor enthusiast who loves to hike, who loves to be outdoors, who loves to actually camp. Would they be right? <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> I think you know. Yes. Yeah, I'm pretty indoorsy. <laughs> and I have to credit Jim Gaffigan with this. This is not my word. But he's like, he says, I'm what you call indoorsy. Yeah, I've never been a super outdoors person. I, once we are camping, I'm like, oh, yeah, I see what people are talking about. But I never want to go camping. It's such a pain in the ass. Yeah, I don't get it. Like, I don't, yeah, I'm not, I just tend to be more, um, I want to sit on my little urban porch with my journal and like walk in a garden of flowers. But I, yeah, I've never, I've never been super outdoorsy. Um, I mean, I've never said, oh, I'd love to live in a, across from a field of cows. Like, I would never, ever say that. I mean, I grew up in a small town with lots of cows and I would drive past and think, oh my gosh, that must be terrible. And so in Costa Rica, I lived across from a pasture of cows. <laughs> and even though, I mean, I've worn cowgirl boots my whole life and cows have never been in my radar, right? So 
every day I would sit on my patio and I patio, my deck, and watch the Brahma bulls. And they would chew their cud and eat the grass and swat the flies in the shade. And they ended up providing me with this immense comfort. They were so calm. They only knew how to be a cow, right? They weren't worried about climate change or Google Calendar or my daughter's braces or the Ukraine or how expensive everything seems to be on the menu now. It's just the simplicity of their life was just amazing. I was, I was jealous of them. I'm like, they're so calm. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Kind of, but, but, but there's more, but there's more. So like, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. I could have found cows like, I don't know, 10 miles away in Longmont, right? Um, wouldn't have been that hard. But I did have, I had that aha moment. I'm like, oh, this is what people are talking about when they're loving nature and animals. This is like the insidious power of outdoor spaces. This is why people are obsessed with hiking in Colorado, right? And I am not. So, yeah, okay, quote, this is the insidious power <laughs> of outdoor <laughs> spaces. Am I making outdoor spaces seem evil? Is that, is that why, what? As, as I, I, there's, there's definitely an emphasis there that you don't normally, I don't yeah, normally right. hear. So, because when I went to Costa Rica, I did not do, nor did I plan on doing, like, a ton of surfing or hiking or kayaking or camping or traditional outdoor activities. I'm just, like I say, I'm not that person. But. I did do a lot of domesticated activities and somehow nature wove itself in. I sat on my deck a lot. I rode through the jung- through jungled land on the way to the grocery store. I drove across rivers to drive my daughter's French friend home. I walked barefoot in the mud a lot. We didn't wear shoes for like a good portion of the year. I was often in the rain with no umbrella and no coat on my way to a coffee shop. Um, I did jump from a few cliff faces and waterfalls. And I regularly saw like bats, iguanas, tropical birds, massive bugs. And my clients always thought they were working, that I was working in an aviary. They were always like, are you at the zoo or something? <laughs> because of all the bird sounds. And I listened to hundreds of frogs, sometimes so loud that my family and I couldn't hear each other speak. And every other day I ran and hopstocked scotched through the tide pools when along the point of where the ocean meets the land, just like I was walking on a wire in a circus. If every, anyone knows that line, they totally will get a postcard from me. And I realized this is part of why I went to Costa Rica. I didn't go for the outdoors, but the outdoors got in. Mm. And I, I, mean, I knew I wouldn't find nature on my own. So in a way, I had to get out of my own damn way. So I set up my life so nature would find me. Nature snuck into my consciousness. Um, so much for that, that for the first time in my life, I questioned my urban life in Denver, mm. which is weird because I'm definitely an urban girl. Mm-hmm. And when I came back, I felt just a little claustrophobic in my little bl- bungalow in Platt Park. Mm-hmm. And I now, um, yeah, I miss Costa Rica for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm hearing that even if you're not outdoorsy, and still today, that you are comfortable being indoorsy with some nature coming in. Um, that because when it does come in, it comes in in heels, which is huge. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm also hearing that moving towards something that you're not typically or intuitively attractive to can be beneficial, and it just takes a little bit of time to get comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's true. It's tough to know when that is, though. If you're not attracted to something, if it's not a fuck yes, well, then you shouldn't do it. So what do you think? When do you know when to push your boundaries and push your edges and when not to? Well, what I'm hearing, though, is that you knew going to going abroad was a fuck yes, and then if you did all your research, that going to Costa Rica was the fuck yes. And I think then at that point, you're surrendered, and then what comes in comes in. Right, like so that nature came in by the fact that that's where you were going to be spending time. So, in my experience, right, the, there's often like you have one initial fuck yes, and then there's a waterfall or a cascade of what comes after mm-hmm. that. But it's not that you're saying fuck yes to the cascade ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Good point. Yeah, that makes sense. So, why did you come home? Although I'm so glad that you did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, 
why did we come home? We needed a bigger town. Nosara, where we lived, is an expat sprinkled surfing village right on the ocean. Very small. I desperately miss my friends, including you, for sure. That's a big reason we came back. Friends and family, of course. While I loved the ocean, I didn't love beach culture. Mm. It was a little empty for me. Maybe it was about the outdoors. You know, if I, if I had embraced the outdoors all the time or if that was my thing, that would be enough. But I like concerts and bookstores and... Culture of a different sort. Yeah, libraries and lots of different types of people. And I think I'm just also American at heart. There is some deep American roots in me. I have lived in Beirut, Bulgaria, England, Costa Rica, and I've loved every experience, and I always want to come home. Mm. Oh, that's so cliche. <laughs> <laughs> and now here it is, a year, almost a year to the day later. It is, yeah. What is one tangible thing that you have been able to bring home from your Costa Rican life and continue to maintain here in the urban center of Denver? Yeah, well, I do have, I have this beautiful office in my house that is stacked with books and has a right sign and has a flower-carved wooden oxen yoke that I got in Costa Rica and local art and matchbox collections and Greek pottery. But do I sit in there? In my teeny tiny house? No, I sit on the porch because I want to be outside. Like, I really like to be outside. Mm -hmm. And that is a big difference for me. I didn't used to sit on the porch for my meetings. Mm. And I just love it. Yeah. And you sit out <laughs> on the porch year round. You yes. have a space heater with your hat and your gloves and your like pajamas underneath your robe, underneath your jacket, cold, yes. sitting on the porch. Yes, I will sit. I will sit as long, I, typically as long as it's above 20. I will sit out there in the early morning in the dark and I love it. The, the cold wakes me up and I'm not even a cold weather person. I hate skiing. I don't like snowboarding. <laughs> okay, but I think I want, I now just want you to know that I think you've just defined a really badass indoorsy person. <laughs> Yay, I'm a badass indoorsy person. Oh my gosh. I'm a bip. I'm totally going to quote that. <laughs> because you know yeah there's something like oh i don't do that I yeah don't that's do pretty that. hardcore it's a hardcore sitting on the porch in 20 degree weather because you but like yes you're only a foot away from your living room wall but you're on the other side of it yes because it's so much more it makes me feel alive well that feels like the mic drop that feels <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel alive <laughs> costa rica made you feel alive for the year that you were there now you're coming home sitting on your porch you feel more alive yeah that's true. Okay, so let's just recap some of the things that you got from your year abroad. One was that it shook you out of the Amazon comfort world mm -hmm. and changed the life of your 12-year-old daughter of being able to be exposed to another culture. Mm -hmm. You also realized that being alone or alone having alone time is critical mm -hmm. for everybody, that slowing down is okay. Mm -hmm. And that you don't need a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. That limp bits <laughs> were your lesson <laughs> in how to let go. And that despite being an indoorsy person, nature found its way into your soul, mm -hmm. healed you, and in that way, the outdoors has made its way into your life mm -hmm. in Denver. That's true. Yeah. So instead of homework for our Brave Hearts this week, I would love for you to share music, poetry, a book, anything that was part of your soundtrack to your time in Costa Rica. It's one of my favorite songs that I discovered at the Ista Retreat. It's by Isla Nurio. She is a singer-songwriter from Oregon, and she has a song called Turning Wake. I played this song over and over and over, and it is truly about a reawakening. And it 
soothes my soul to this day. And I have to actually, I have to give credit to Blake Zeeler because he's the one that played it at the yoga class mm -hmm. at the Issa retreat um, mm -hmm. when I went to that early morning class. That song saved me. The second music <laughs> reference I had to make is to Florence and the Machine. <laughs> Shake It Out became my mantra. I would scream that song as I was running on the beach. And it was a powerful and creative life force for me in the mornings, in the evenings, anytime. It got me going and it made me really happy. Beautiful. And for those brave hearts who caught that if you get any of her references to movies or song lyrics, then she will send you a postcard via snail mail. So all you have to do is go to our website, fill out the form, and put in your address. Send us an email, and you'll get a surprise in your mailbox. <laughs> Yay. Okay, Rave Hearts, once again, thank you so much for listening. We love you. Bye. Do you need permission to be human? You got it. Listen, subscribe, and review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Learn more about us at permissiontobehuman.live.